A beast of myth and a staple in many fantasy worlds, this creature is among the most notorious legends, yet it is nowhere to be found in 5th edition D&D. Today, however, we're gonna fix that. Welcome to a brand new episode of Monster of the Week, the show where we dig up old creatures from the past and bring them to light for use in your current 5th edition game. My name is Joe Saya, also known as Dungeon Dad, and today we are going to be talking about a creature that you might actually be surprised to find out isn't in the Monster Manual. I am of course talking about the Phoenix. If you are in the minority out there who does not know what a Phoenix is, I will give you a brief rundown. Basically, a phoenix is a legendary bird who, upon death, would burst into flames and then be reborn from the ashes of its previous body, hence the expression to rise from the ashes. It's a very iconic symbol in many different cultures and means different things to different parts of the world, but in most places it's a symbol of the sun, of prosperity, rebirth, and life. It's generally a benevolent creature in most legends and it is regarded primarily as some kind of guardian, or at the very least a well-meaning spirit. The Phoenix is such a classic fantasy trope that comes from many different mythologies here in the real world that I just assumed it was in the Monster Manual because it's been in like every edition of D&D up until now. I didn't even know it wasn't in one of the books until I was thinking about using one in an upcoming game in one, one of my campaigns that I run and I was looking for it and couldn't find it. It was at this point that I then checked Volo's guide and realized it wasn't in there either, so I did a quick Google search because what are the odds, maybe I just had a defective monster manual, and sure enough, there is no current official Phoenix monster stat block in 5th edition. I found this very surprising, and I'm sure there's a reason why they chose not to include it, because there's no way that it wasn't at least brought up once as a potential monster. So maybe I'll tweet at Mike Burles and see if he gets back to me. I am genuinely curious about why it's not in the game. But in any case, that is what I'm here for. And we're going to dig into this creature, which has a ton of potential. And hopefully come up with what is a useful Phoenix monster stat block lore situation for you to use in your 5th edition game. Just like the monster I covered last week, however, this monster today, the stat block that you can find in the description below, is mostly a combination of all the different phoenixes from multiple versions of the game as well as some stuff that I've just kind of come up that I thought fit more in line with 5th edition. So where I would talk about modifications I've made to the base creature, we're gonna skip over that part of the video because the whole thing is basically just a mishmash of other monsters. But as always, we are gonna talk about what this thing can do in battle and then some good ideas for plot hooks that you might be able to use in your campaign if you wanna introduce a phoenix. Our first order of business, however, though, is going to be talking about why you should never antagonize a phoenix in... It should be no surprise to anyone that this creature is going to be a fairly high CR. I placed the CR at CR 16. After all, we are dealing with a legend here. So without making it too ridiculous and over the top, I'm looking at you, Tarask, which would be easy to do. I decided to put it at 16 so that it still has some versatility in how we can use it and will actually be more useful, I think, to a general group of players than just those playing at epic levels. I tried to give it abilities that I felt were the most interesting from some of the versions of the Phoenix we've already had, but also that fit it the most thematically and made it the most usable, really. So just to talk about the stats really quick, uh, it can walk at 30 feet, which is pretty normal. However, it can fly at 130 feet, which is pretty fast. It has a pretty massive hit point pool on account of the fact that it's rolling d20s for hit points because it is gargantuan. It's got very high strength, high constitution, uh, good wisdom and very high charisma as well. I based its initial stats off of the rock, which has crazy physical stats, and then just boosted up its charisma because of its just what it is. It's this benevolent, like, fiery being. And fiery beings in 5th edition, or in most of Dungeons & Dragons in general, are usually associated with being very charismatic. As you would expect, being a fiery sun quasi-deity or aligned creature at the very least, it is completely immune to fire and radiant damage. I also chose to give it resistance to cold because it is in fact so hot that cold damage 
which would normally be super effective against some fire based creatures is actually going to do less because it's heated up on its way to impacting the creature. It has keen sight, which is another trait that I borrowed from the rock, which is literally just because it's a giant bird. It literally has a bird's eye view, which gives it advantage on perception checks. So our first somewhat combat oriented ability is called Shriek. This ability comes to us from the version of the Phoenix we find in the second edition monstrous manual, and it's pretty cool. Essentially, whenever initiative is rolled and the phoenix enters combat, it lets out an ear-splitting cry. Everyone within 260 feet of the phoenix is just straight up deafened for one minute. Any creature that's within six miles that can hear it has to make a DC 18 wisdom save or become frightened of the phoenix. Of course, once you get past who's actually involved in the battle, it becomes kind of irrelevant. You might just have random townsfolk like a couple miles away that are now just scared of this creature that's quite some ways away. It's not really going to be a threat to them immediately anyways, but I just love the flavor of that. It serves its purpose in battle, but if you have anyone else who is somewhat nearby within a few miles that hears this and becomes afraid of it, they're going to know like we should not go over there in that direction. There's something terrible that we don't want to deal with. And that could also help tie into some plot hooks and stuff too, but I'm getting ahead of myself. We're not at that part of the video yet. So the next trait I've given this creature is called the Aura of Eternal Flame. This was mostly my own creation. However, I did kind of borrow some inspiration on this from how dragons work in fourth edition. But basically the Phoenix emits an aura of bright light. So within 60 feet of it, it sheds brilliant light and within 120 feet, it sheds dim light. This is because it is literally always on fire or depending on your interpretation of the Phoenix lore is at least imbued with the power of fire and light. This light, unlike many other effects that do something similar, is considered natural sunlight, so vampires beware. And the biggest thing here is that at the start of its turn, if it chooses to, it can exude heat within that radius, causing all creatures within that initial 60 feet to take a bit of fire damage and be subjected to the heat metal spell. Also, the 120 foot area around the Phoenix is constantly under the effect of a detect good and evil spell, which allows the Phoenix to kind of learn about some creatures as it, they get close to it, basically. So if you're a demon in disguise, it'll notice. Now, much like the AD&D version of this creature, it can cast a few spells, but if you look at the actual AD&D entry, it is just a mess. It's like two pages of spells that it can use, half of which are going to be mostly irrelevant, and it's just a crazy amount of work if you want to actually use this creature. So there are a few spells in 5th edition I wanted to give this creature access to, which I did, but the spell list is much more limited and focused on what we really want this creature to be about. So at will, at any time, this creature can cast Death Ward, freedom of movement, and remove curse. This is all just kind of playing into that idea of the phoenix as a benevolent free spirit. And then three times per day, it can cast uh, greater restoration, firestorm, resurrection, and regenerate. Firestorm seems fairly obvious, but the others kind of play into, again, this role of the phoenix being able to revitalize and rejuvenate not only itself, but others around it. Also, I feel like this creature should absolutely be able to cast Resurrection, and that could be another reason why you might put a Phoenix in your game if you're running an otherwise low fantasy setting. Which brings us to our final spell, it can cast True Resurrection once per day. Now, as a gargantuan-sized bird, it of course has a very powerful beak and talon attacks. I literally just based this off of the rock that you find in the monster manual. It does the same amount of damage and everything, except I think it's a little bit more because its strength score is up by one. If it hits you with its talon attack, you are restrained and grappled, which also means it can't use its talons again until it lets go of that creature. However, again, it should be able to pick people up because it's a massive bird. Moving on. I gave it an offensive ability called Radiant Fire Breath, which works exactly the same way as a dragon's fire breath, except instead of doing straight up fire, it does half fire and half radiant damage. This isn't just regular fire, this is Holy Phoenix fire. And that kind of brought us to a good place where I was generally happy with this creature and what it could do, what it was all about. However, I did want to give it some legendary actions as well because it's a legendary creature. So it has three actions per turn and it has three different things that it can do. Using one legendary action, it can make an insight check with advantage. This is just kind of playing to the idea that the Phoenix has great instincts about what people are going to do and how people behave. So it can make a check to basically try to figure out what someone else might do on their turn. Its second ability, which costs two legendary actions, is called Restore, which allows the Phoenix to regain a 
small amount of hit points. This just gives it an option, so no matter what the situation, it always has something it wants to do, and again, plays into that idea that the phoenix is very full of life and able to restore itself somewhat. Lastly, using up all three legendary actions, it has Flare. This is a pure offensive ability where the phoenix flaps its wings and exudes as much heat as it possibly can. All creatures within 120 feet are knocked prone and take a good amount of fire damage as it just exudes that heat onto them. Of course, they are allowed a DC 21 dexterity check to try to avoid some of that fire damage, but ultimately they are going to end up knocked prone at the very least. So this is what I put together for what this creature's abilities should be, and I think it's pretty in line with what the Phoenix is all about. But what's most exciting to me about this creature is some ways that we can use it, so let's move on to... The Phoenix is potentially a very diverse individual creature. It can play the role of a powerful benefactor in some situations, a powerful villain in others, or something in between in a lot of different worlds. As I briefly touched on before, it can make a great tool for bringing back a dead player instead of using a resurrection spell in a campaign setting that might be relatively low magic. Maybe instead of trying to find a, like a 15th level spellcaster or whoever who can cast Raise Dead or something to that effect, the temple explains to the players that are trying to resurrect their dead friend that they can do it, but they need a phoenix feather to assist in the ritual, because they don't have that kind of power. So the players can then trek up to this great mountain where the phoenix has made its nest, and try to get a feather from it. How they do that might be up to them. They could try to take it down in battle if they're high enough level and they feel they're up to the task. Maybe they try to sneak in and just steal a feather and then run down the mountain. Or maybe the phoenix is in some kind of trouble and by helping it out, it rewards them with a feather to bring back their dead friend. It's also very possible that the phoenix in your world is more intelligent and has a way of communicating. Or even if it can't speak just as it is, it can kind of empathically figure out what's going on. So it might send the players on some kind of quest to complete a task for it in exchange for a feather, which will then in turn bring their comrade back to life. Maybe they just bring their dead friend with them so the phoenix can just cast true resurrection on that person. Transporting a body to a place where a phoenix might make its home isn't necessarily going to be the easiest thing in the world, but it's possible. You could also forgo all of the lore about it being a benevolent kind of creature and just have the phoenix set up as a rock type giant bird monster that can also breathe fire and use all these other fantastical abilities. Maybe it's liable to lash out at the people who are infringing upon its territory, so the party gets sent on some kind of monster hunt-like quest to take it down. You could also easily set the phoenix up as a god to a small village that might live in the mountain near its domain. Perhaps there's a small mountain town where the people seem to live like a stupid amount of time, like it's mostly humans say, but they all have lifespans exceeding well over three or four hundred years, which is very unnatural for a human. This could be because the phoenix that lives in those mountains blesses the villagers with extremely long lifespans by sharing its rejuvenative powers. And as thanks for this, there's a small temple set up to the phoenix, or maybe they bring in offerings, or maybe the phoenix is just happy to do it because it's a nice creature. Whatever the case is, that could just be an interesting location. The party might not even interact with the phoenix directly, but just knowing that it's there and this village kind of exists is a neat locale for something to happen. Another way you could use the phoenix is maybe instead of a magical beast that is a phoenix, there's only one of them. There's just a phoenix in the world that is constantly reborn in every time it dies. Perhaps the phoenix is kind of a guardian spirit of the world that resides on some insanely tall peak and never really shows up unless it's needed to kind of protect the balance. Basically like an extremely powerful ally to a druid. You could even set up a druidic circle or monkish order of the phoenix that kind of reveres this creature and practices its ways of preserving peace and life across the world. Maybe their magic specialties are in restorative magic and resurrections and pyromancy. I mean, this could actually play into a situation I kind of mentioned a minute ago, where you've got this society or kingdom advancing too far into the phoenix's domain, and the phoenix has started lashing out at them, and maybe it's got its monks and druids reaching out to try to destroy the frontiers of this great civilization. The Empire, of course, brands these people as terrorists, and the party might be tasked with taking some of them down, or assisting in protecting caravans of supplies, or whatever this case is, the PCs are on the Empire's side. Only as they progress do they realize that the Empire is actually destroying part of the natural world and the Phoenix is just guarding what it has and trying to protect everyone to preserve that balance. 
then they have to make a choice, and that campaign could easily go one of two ways. The players might switch sides and kind of join with the resistance, or maybe they continue fighting on behalf of the Empire because the gold is just too good. I guess my point being here is there's a lot of room to explore what you can do with a phoenix, and it's one of those things that's so ingrained in our mythology in the real world and just pop culture now at this point that your players will instantly know what a phoenix is all about and you don't have to spend a lot of extra time explaining what its deal is. Whenever you can find a creature like that, it makes inserting it into a world a whole lot easier. Now that is everything I really have to say about this creature today, so hopefully you enjoyed listening to me talk about the phoenix, and hopefully you've been inspired to find a way to use it in your game. I do apologize for the lateness on this video, I had some technical issues last weekend that just prevented me from getting it out until now, so please forgive me for my tardiness, I promise it probably won't happen again anytime in the near future. If you are new here and you like what I do, you want to support the channel, please subscribe, I've got at least one new video every week except for when I don't because of technical issues. And as always in the description below, you'll find all of our social media stuff, Reddit, Twitter, Facebook, uh, Discord. We have lots of good chats over there, so if you're into talking about nerdy stuff with other nerdy people, Discord is the place to be. And of course, you can find the stat block for this monster linked in the description below in a Google document, or if you are one of my patrons, you can find the link to that on the Patreon page, which was posted a few days ago. Anyways, that is everything for today, so thank you so much for watching. I do appreciate it, and I will see you in the next video. Till then.